It is August 20th, 2021, and 76 years ago today, on August 20th, 1955, United States Air Force Colonel Horace Haynes set the world's first supersonic speed record in a North American Aviation F-100C Super Sabre fighter jet. Today we are well into the era of supersonic aircraft, but supersonic aircraft are still rare, each one a marvel to both engineering and their pilots' prowess. The early aviation pioneers who challenged the terrifying sound barrier helped scientists to better understand the dynamics of superfast travel. And the history of some of these supersonic firsts deserves to be remembered. In 1929, Swiss physicist Jacob Ackert gave a lecture describing aerodynamic drag at high speeds. When an aircraft passes through the air, it creates a series of pressure waves in front of the aircraft and behind it, similar to the bow and stern waves created by a boat. These waves travel at the speed of sound, and as the speed of the object increases, the waves are forced together or compressed because they cannot get out of each other's way quickly enough. As this occurs, the shock wave causes drag. In his lecture, Ackert noted that it would be very convenient to have a special name for the important ratio of flow speed to sound speed. He proposed calling that number a Mach number, an homage to German physicist Ernst Mach, who in 1887 had done tests on supersonic projectiles. In fluid dynamics, the Mach number represents the ratio of flow velocity past a boundary to the local speed of sound. By definition, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. Mach 0.65 is 65% of the speed of sound. Mach 1.35 would be 35% faster than the speed of sound. In his experiments, all the way back in 1887, Ernst Mach was able to actually photograph and see the head wave at the front of a supersonic projectile. And the shock waves that he described would represent a significant obstacle to aeronautical engineers trying to design an airplane that could approach Mach 1. While the Mach number represents a ratio of flow speed to sound speed, the speed of sound itself is defined as the distance traveled per unit of time by a sound wave as it propagates through an elastic medium. And that number varies by the temperature and the nature of the medium. And as an object comes closer to the speed of sound, it becomes increasingly difficult to further increase speed. In brief, as the aircraft approaches the speed of sound, shock waves form, the same ones photographed by Ernst Mach. Those waves cause a separation or a wake in the airflow that both increases drag and makes the airflow around the aircraft unsteady. This challenge is referred to as the sound barrier, and it was once quite the technical obstacle to overcome. As an airplane approaches the sound barrier, shock waves form around it, producing both drag and disrupting airflow. And even if an engine could produce enough power to overcome the drag, the aerodynamic forces involved render the aircraft uncontrollable. The concept was largely misunderstood by the public as being a physical limit, like a literal wall, but of course it wasn't any such thing. Rockets and artillery shells exceeded the speed of sound. For manned flight, it was an issue of design. As a 2017 article on Space.com puts it, bullets and cannonballs had exceeded the speed of sound for hundreds of years, but the question loomed as to whether or not a plane or a man could withstand the pressures that accompanied it. While there were many unverified claims, the flight that is officially recorded as having broken the sound barrier was flown by U.S. Air Force Captain Chuck Yeager on October 14, 1947, in a Bell X-1 experimental rocket plane, which he named Glamorous Glennis after his wife. The unique challenges of the sound barrier made the X-1 a truly unique aircraft. For example, the fuselage was literally designed in the shape of an M2 50 caliber machine gun bullet, because that shape was known to be stable in flight. That radical concept was indicative of the out-of-the-box thinking required. Because of that, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration argues that the X-1 was important beyond testing the sound barrier, noting on the NASA webpage that they established the concept of the research aircraft built solely for experimental purposes and unhampered by any military or commercial requirements. While the Air Force wanted to test various concepts of transonic and supersonic flight, an accelerated test program was created focused on being the first aircraft to break the sound barrier, a milestone important to international prestige, even though the program itself was at the time top secret. The X-1 didn't take off from the ground on its own power, but instead was carried on a drop launch by a B-29 Superfortress. The rocket only carried enough fuel for less than five minutes of powered flight. During the flight, the X-1's 50th, the 6,000-pound thrust rocket powered by liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol carried Jaeger past the sound barrier, becoming the first airplane recognized to fly at supersonic speed in level flight. Jaeger and his X-1 remained supersonic for just 20 seconds. 
Famously, Jaeger had broken two ribs when he was thrown from a horse two days before the flight. Knowing that he wouldn't be allowed to fly in that condition, he had hidden his injury from his superiors. At the time, the program was considered to be a matter of national security, and the whole program was intended to be kept top secret, but news of the world's first supersonic flight was somehow leaked to Aviation Week magazine. The Air Force threatened to sue any reporter who reported on the story, but no lawsuits ever developed, and by June of 1948, the Air Force officially acknowledged that the sound barrier had been broken. While the story of Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier in the X-1 is reasonably well known, much less is known about the Miles M-52. In 1943, the United Kingdom issued a specification asking for a plane that could go the then unheard of speed of 1,000 miles per hour. The result was the experimental M-52 built by Miles Aircraft. The design was promising, but in February 1946 was cancelled by the United Kingdom's government for economic reasons before manned testing could occur. The post-war government was intent on reducing costs and was making deep cuts. At the time, the first prototype was 82% complete. Miles thought they might have a prototype that could break the sound barrier within as little as three months. The project was kept secret and the British public was not made aware of how close the project came to testing a supersonic aircraft. Aviation historian Miles Amos told the Discovery Channel that the cancellation of the M-52 was, without doubt, the most catastrophic event in the annals of British aviation. But the British had agreed to share data on supersonic flight with the Americans, an agreement that was reportedly not fairly reciprocated by the United States. The Bell X-1 initially had control problems when it approached the sound barrier. Shock waves caused the nose to pitch up and down. The problem was solved by using a variable incidence tail, which could control the effect an idea which apparently came from the M-52 research. While the M-52 was not the first supersonic aircraft, its development made a contribution to Jaeger's accomplishment. A one-third scale model of the M-52 successfully broke the sound barrier in a test in October 1948. There were some claims going all the way back to the Second World War of aircraft breaking the sound barrier, but airspeed indicators are unreliable at those speeds, and those claims are generally considered to be not credible. But there are some who argue that Chuck Yeager was not the first to break the sound barrier, that he might have been beaten by another American, George Welch. Like Yeager, Welch was a World War II fighter ace, and was perhaps most famous as one of the few fighter pilots to get airborne and engage the Japanese during the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. In 1944, Welch had resigned his military commission in order to become a test pilot for North American aviation, and had been assigned as the chief test pilot for their experimental swept wing XP-86. The XP-86 was the prototype for the F-86, the Sabre Jet, a legendary aircraft that would become the most produced jet fighter in the West. In his 1998 book, Aces Wild, The Race for Mach 1, former test pilot Al Blackburn contended, based on witness interviews, that Welch, flying the XP-86, broke the sound barrier on the plane's first test flight on October 1st, 1947, beating Jaeger by two weeks, a claim that has been contended by other authors as well. The Air Force was newly created and fighting for their place among the military services. Welch was working for North American Aviation while Jaeger was still an Air Force officer. And the argument goes, the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington, had decreed that the honor had to go to a serving pilot. As both projects were Air Force projects and both were kept secret for security reasons, the Air Force could control the story. Welch was allowed to break the sound barrier, he just couldn't tell anyone. Still another argument made is that Welch did not have the same measurement controls, and so his flight speed could not be verified. However, a September 2014 edition of Air and Space Magazine brings the Welch claim into question. On the first test flight of the XB-86, Welch had had trouble with the nose landing gear, which first would not retract, and then would not extend. Welch managed to land safely, using a deft landing maneuver that forced the gear down, but it is unlikely that the plane could have exceeded the speed of sound with the gear not fully retracted. Air and space goes on. For the next few tests, North American decided it would be safer to fly the XP-86 with the gear locked down, creating too much drag for mock busting. The next time the aircraft flew with the gear retracted was after Jaeger had taken the X-1 supersonic. Moreover, Air and Space searched all available records, was not able to find any Air Force record of the XP-86 breaking the sound barrier until April 26, 1948. For his part, George Welch does not appear to have ever publicly claimed to have broken the sound barrier ahead of Jaeger. Still, the 2018 book Chasing the Demon by retired Air Force Colonel Dan Hamden maintains that, based on a sonic boom heard on the ground, Welch broke the sound barrier on October 1st, and the true supersonic first remains matter of dispute. Interestingly, both Chuck Yeager and the F-86 played a role in another supersonic first in May 
of 1953. Jackie Cochran was a pioneer female aviator in the 1930s, earning her pilot's license in 1932 after just three weeks of lessons. She set the world speed record for women in 1937 and won the prestigious Bendix Trophy in 1938. Already world famous as a flyer, she served with the British Royal Air Force's Air Transit Authority before America entered the Second World War, and later became the first director of the United States Women Air Force Service Pilots. She was still setting records in 1952 when at the age of 47 she decided that she wanted to set the women's speed record again and wanted to do it in an F-86, the production model of the plane that George Welch had flown. But there was a hitch. The United States refused to let her borrow one. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum explains military aircraft were not available to civilians and especially female pilots. But Jackie Cochran was a determined sort. The F-86 was also produced under license by the Canadair Company, whose Canadair Sabres were mostly used by the Royal Canadian Air Force. Having struck out with the United States Air Force, Jackie went to the Royal Canadian Air Force, but she was again refused. So she tried a different tack. According to the newspaper, the Ottawa Citizen, she went up to the Canadair plant in Montreal, which builds Sabres, and finally became a consultant to its directors. After that, it was easy. Technically, she took the Sabre South to make some tests that couldn't be made here. She made her attempt to break the women's speed record over Edwards Air Force Base and was coached by a personal friend, Chuck Yeager, who followed her in a chase plane. Thus, the first man to break the sound barrier assisted the first woman to break the sound barrier who was flying the model aircraft that some argue had actually been the first to break the sound barrier. On May 18, 1953, at Rogers Dry Lake, California, she made two supersonic dives, regaining the women's world speed record and becoming the first woman to break the sound barrier. In 1964, she would set records again, flying a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter at twice the speed of sound. To this day, Jackie Cochran holds more speed and distance flying records than any pilot, man or woman, dead or alive. It was an evolution of the F-86, the F-100C Super Sabre that Colonel Horace A. Haynes used to break the world speed record on August 20, 1955, winning the prestigious Thompson Trophy and setting the world speed record for an aircraft over course in straight flight. While the F-100 was not the first supersonic plane, it was the first supersonic world speed record. The record run of 870.627 miles per hour was leaked to the press by North American Aviation, which received criticism for revealing classified information. The F-100 competes with the Soviet Mikian Gurevich MiG-19 as the first production aircraft capable of supersonic speeds in level flight. The MiG-19 was ordered earlier than the F-100, but the F-100 was delivered first. The vast majority of the supersonic aircraft that have been produced are military fighter jets, the sort of sports cars of the military, where the need to get to and intercept strategic bombers in a hurry, as well as the reduced obstacles because of their small size, makes them more practical, although certainly not inexpensive. By comparison, there have been relatively few supersonic strategic bombers built, mainly because they are relatively expensive to operate, and supersonic speed does little to protect them in an era of guided missiles. While engineers today better understand the aerodynamics of supersonic flight, it still produces obstacles. Lift ratios are very different at supersonic and subsonic speeds, and supersonic transports face obstacles of fuel consumption and noise required to address lower lift-to-drag ratios. There are additional concerns over environmental effects. While supersonic passenger aircraft have flown, they have faced economic challenges, especially versus the much larger passenger capacity of modern subsonic jet airliners. And currently, none are still flying. But right now, there are several companies that are trying to leverage new developments in fuel, in engines, in materials that might allow them to produce what they think could be commercially viable supersonic passenger aircraft. And the world might be on the verge of seeing another set of supersonic firsts. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.